What's up, everybody? This is Whiskey in the Six. I'm Rob. Today I have a special guest with us, Mark Bylock. Mark, why don't you introduce yourself, buddy? Hey, Rob. Great to be on. Thank you for having me on. Um, so my name is Mark Bylock. I uh, wrote a whiskey book a few years ago. Uh, I've been writing about whiskey for several years and uh, very fortunate to be an author. And I have a podcast called The Whiskey Topic that I co-host. And I basically do this for every day, which I, it's a wonderful thing to do. And it's a uh, very much feel very fortunate for that. So uh, thank you for having me on. No, it's my pleasure. Why, why don't you tell us a little bit about the book? Um, yeah. When did that get published? When did you start writing it? Well, it's funny. It started right here in Toronto, which I, I, I love uh, that part of the story because uh, it's uh, I used to do this uh, uh, article for a website called Spotlight Toronto called The Whiskey Cabinet. And the idea being is I'd pick up two whiskeys and every, every month and I'd recommend two whiskeys that were available at the LCBO. So it was very... Ontario focused uh, and it was called the whiskey cabinet and a publisher uh, picked it up and they were like, you know, we, we think this will make a good book. And it was that kind of era where whiskey had hit off, but there weren't a lot of books yet. So it was like, there's a couple of books that were published, but it was, it was really uh, a prime time. So I got a, a book deal out of it and uh, they, they did a great job. Like this is the, this is the book here. Uh, it's kind of like a bit of a coffee table book. Cause it's, you know, it's got, it's got a lot of photos in it. You know, it's a, uh, in case you don't read, in case you don't like reading, it's got photos in it. But it's it's intended to be like an intro to whiskey, um, and it re you know reviews a lot of the common whiskey. So whether it's a bourbon, Canadian whiskey, rye, Japanese whiskey, uh, Scotch, of course, a lot of single malt Scotch in there. Uh, and the idea being is like if you're starting out or you have like five or six, so not quite what you've got there, Rob. Like if you got like five or six whiskeys in your cabinet, what, where should you expand? Like where should you go? Uh, and that's the that's the way the book was written. And so I. Uh, I wrote the book in 2013, the, uh, late 2013. The book came out in late 2014, early 2015. Uh, became a bestseller on Amazon. It's done very, very well in a very competitive market. So when I started writing, nobody was writing a whiskey book. When that book came out, Whiskey Cabinet came out, there was several books, very similar in design because we weren't, my publisher wasn't the only person to see this gap in the market. So there was a lot of great books released at that time. And we all did relatively well. We all had, you know, had our successes in that, in that publishing side of things. Very cool. Yeah, um, I actually wrote a book myself, but it's not about whiskey, and it's, uh, I don't know how good it is, to be honest with you. I haven't got it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. You got to start, man. You got to start. You know, the edit, yeah. I'll tell you, one thing, uh, one thing for the book, uh, one recommendation just for any sort of book writing um, is you'll be surprised how much better the book gets in edit. So you get a fantastic editor, and these guys do such a great job. And so I had it in a manuscript that was about 45,000 words. And the editor came back and said, you need to do more of this, less of this, and rewrite this. And, and having somebody give me that direction was great. So the, the manuscript was 50,000 words. I rewrote like, you know, 15 to 18,000 words in a span of, you know, a month and a half uh, to tighten up parts. Uh, and so having that editor. So the one thing I learned, if you ever want to write a book, the one thing I learned is, it doesn't have to be perfect because you can't like you're too close to the project to do a perfect book, but you get an editor that makes it better. And of course, perfect is the wrong word, but to make the book better and, and that kind of relationship really helps. So yeah, you know, perfect what? just, just kind of has to be there and to, to good, good to work with an editor. That makes a lot of sense to be honest with you. And that's actually what I'm striving for is just to get to that point where I can have somebody break down my book and tell me what's wrong with it and like what needs to be done to change it and make it better. But whatever, that's, that's a topic for another day. Today we have uh, poor man's Pappy and yes. Mark talking about it and reviewing it. I have a bottle yeah. here sitting here for probably about two months, maybe a little bit longer than that. Uh, how, yeah. You have a bottle there. You want to show the, show the audience? Yeah, so poor man Poppy comes in several variations, but this is the this is the uh, old Weller antique, the 107. Uh, so this is the same we the same uh, bill as old Rip Van Winkle. Uh, that's the same proof level. Uh, this one's aged for ten years. This one's aged for about seven years. It does it doesn't have an age statement on it, so you don't really know. Um, but this is one of many, right? Because Weller does Weller 12. Uh, there's Weller Reserve, so there's a bunch of different Weller products, but they're all known as Poor Man's Pappy because they use the exact same recipe that, that these guys do, um, and the same distillery, the same everything. So it's essentially a very similar product, um, but this is famous, and this is now famous as well. Um, I'm going to crack this open, but 
Um, this used to be about a $25 a bourbon. This used to be a $35 bourbon. Uh, this is now a two, $300 bourbon out of a store in the U S and yep. this is now also about a hundred to $150. So I, I, if I was in the U S I could resell this for 150 bucks and just easily make that money. Uh, so we're talking account prices, right? Yeah. And, and the 107, like, I mean, before the lottery this year, it was available on the shelf and you could pick it up for around like 30, 40 bucks, something like that. Yeah, it is one of the few benefits of being in Ontario. They, they, they don't gouge you on the prices. It's hard to get, but they do use list prices. So this is listed at 35 bucks. And so uh, this one was bought in the lottery, but uh, I also bought like three or four bottles when they were on the shelves for 35 bucks as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool, because like the one I have here is a mixture of 40% uh, Weller 12 and 60% uh, Weller 107, old, uh, the um, old Weller there. So it's right. the recipe that people like like to pretend is actually Pappy Van Winkle. Yes, that, that's, you're absolutely right. There is the uh, old, old thing where we were like, that's the recipe. You do 60% of this and 40% of this and people taste back and forth. So I'm going to crack open this as well as you pour that. Um, I, I love this story because I think... Um, I mean, I love it and I hate it because Weller used to be available and you could buy it anywhere and enjoy it anywhere. Um, and when Old Rip Van Winkle started to sell out, uh, people smartened up and they said, hey, Pappy's good. Uh, this is like Pappy. Um, and they, they this started getting bought out as well. I'm just calling up the, um, the live chat on my phone because I was unable to access it on my computer. I'm, I'm still pretty new at these live streams, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, just gonna say what's up to everybody over here. All right. Yeah. And then, yeah. You know, why don't Why don't we talk about um, your podcast and what else is going on with you? As far as like you said, you're a producer. You're you're an author. There's other things going on. So why don't Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so um, the podcast is uh, reaching 100 episodes. It'll be a couple of weeks away. We've got 100 episodes. And uh, the podcast is, is very, very similar to this YouTube channel. It's intended to be super casual. Uh, we sometimes get some, you know, we, uh, it's, it's Jamie Johnson that's uh, now the Belvini brand ambassador that, that you, you interviewed a little while ago. Uh, her and I sometimes talk about, like, pop culture. Most often we talk about whiskey. Uh, we have some great guests on that, you know, like really like legends of the, of the whiskey world. Uh, because we're in Toronto, we don't always get, you know, the people we, we don't always get people here on, at where we are. Uh, but we also travel a bit with the podcast, so we get to interview people on the road. Uh, it's been great, man. It's been a lot of fun. And I love, the, um, I love the way the whiskey world is so friendly and open and just people like invite you into their distilleries and like, here, drink this, do this, uh, you know, and, and give you that experience. And it's really wonderful that way. Yeah. And uh, I got to listen to some of the episodes you talked about the uh, when you went on your trip to Kentucky. That was really, really cool. Um, what, the, what was that experience like? That was pretty awesome. Yeah, uh, Kentucky was great. We, I did uh, two main interviews there, uh, one at Buffalo Trace Distillery and one at Castle and Key. And so the one at Castle and Key uh, was really, really great. Uh, it's the, their master distiller is the first woman master distiller since Prohibition. Uh, she is really, really fantastic, has like just a wonderful uh, experience with whiskey, started off as a vodka drinker and a gin drinker, and then, uh, you know, kind of leaned into whiskey when she got a chemist, uh, her, her PhD in chemistry and decided to do an internship at Woodford Reserve. And became uh, and became their their heir apparent. Uh, Marion Barnes uh, is her name. She became an heir apparent to Woodford Reserve as the master distiller. Now in Kentucky, it's a little different than in Scotland. In Kentucky, the master distiller that is the that is the spot. Uh, in Scotland, they look at the master blender, the person that blends the, the barrels, the final product. Um, but in Kentucky, the master distiller is the the the, the high end or the primo spot. So she was the heir apparent to Woodford Reserve and got this opportunity to partner with the with Castle and Key, uh, which is located on the old Taylor uh, Distillery grounds. Uh, beautiful, beautiful grounds. Uh, it was opened uh, originally in the late 1800s by, uh, by Colonel Taylor, Colonel H. Taylor, that had a great effect on bourbon in the U.S. 
uh, started the Balls and Bond Act, uh, passed the very first Consumer Protection Act uh, that was around whiskey, believe it or not. Uh, you know, uh, Congress in the U.S. didn't care about consumer protection. They didn't care about meat or, you know, water or anything else. Um, but when it came to their whiskey, they actually passed a law uh, assuring a certain quality in whiskey. And that was uh, Colonel E.H. Taylor did that. And his last distillery that he built was Old Taylor Distillery. And so this castle and key is located on those grounds. And just a wonderful, wonderful story. Um, and, uh, you know, she's great. Marin Bards is fantastic, down to earth, um, uh, you know, young and just able to, and just takes a uh, firm hold of this uh, whiskey world. And she's going to do great. I'm looking forward to, to tasting the whiskey they're making there. Yeah, well, and I didn't know that she had a PhD. I, I must have missed that on the, on the podcast. But, um, She's not alone with these PhDs. Like, there's a there's a few master distillers, I guess you can say nowadays, that are getting their PhD in basically like a form of whiskey making. Like um, Don Livermore, for example, he's yeah. he recently. Well, I don't know about recently. I think it was a little while ago, but he has his PhD, and uh, that was what the whole uh, dissertation release was about. Yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, you have the the old school, right? The old school distillers. Uh, and now you've got the, the, the new, uh, new crowd coming in and they're all PhDs and, you know, big university grads, uh, you know, look at Glenn Fittick's master distiller, uh, Hiram Walker or for, for JP Weiser specifically. Um, yeah, they're, they're all, uh, they're all really uh, well educated. It's become a science now. It's, it's still a feeling. I think the mass, best master distillers do both. They, they have a feel for how to make whiskey like they, they used to do in the old days where you kind of smell it and taste it and, and, and you experience it that way, but then they also have, because these are now billion dollar businesses, before they were, you know, they made 10,000 cases of whiskey a year, because now it's a big business, you can't get things wrong. So sure, they have all the computers to kind of keep them in check, uh, or to make sure that they're not missing anything, but it's still that touch and feel and smell, and the best masters still are still do that. Uh, it's just, they have a lot of backup as far as electronics and degrees, and an understanding of how you distill and ferment and all that. Yeah, it's pretty cool because uh, a lot of us whiskey reviewers will joke about how uh, we're kind of learning on the job and by learning we're doing our drinking on the job which is while we're reviewing and uh, kind of as we progress we're getting a little bit better at picking out what these whiskeys are all about but um, I think um, I've got my poured. I mean it's not very old because, like I said, it's a mix of the 12 and the antique. So, um, did you uh, start giving this a nose, or are you going to compare the uh, Van Winkle 10 to the 107? Yeah, let's do that. I'll uh, I'll compare. Just pour the uh, Van Winkle uh, older Van Winkle 10. This is actually one of my favorites too because it's a bottle, not a cast drink, but it's a higher proof. Uh, bourbon, and I tend to like the bourbon's higher proof. Um, I think that's the benefit of bourbon. You know, if you're drinking scotch, you're generally drinking something in, you know, between 40 or 45 percent. If you're drinking bourbon, you do want it on the higher proof end. Um, so 107 is great, 53.5 percent alcohol. Uh, these two are the same proof levels. Um, you know, very, very similar color, uh, even despite this one being aged for three years longer. Um, yeah, and, you know, on the nose, uh, it's, I, I can always tell a Pappy or an old Rick Van Winkle, uh, from the cherry notes. Uh, there's a bit of like, I always get cherry. I get like, I, I think maraschino cherries or, or, or like bitter cherries soaked in alcohol, that kind of, that kind of nose. Yeah. And I find, um, I, I find that, uh, the staple brands on, in the Pappy line, um, you know, the Pappy 15, uh, 2023, 20, the new 25 now. Um, and the 10 and the 12, the, the Rip Van Winkles, um, have that cherry note. And it's a wonderful, wonderful note that comes out beautifully. Uh, and it's unique to that brand, but it's, but weeded whiskeys or weeded bourbons in general always have a hint of it. So, you know, you have a Maker's Mark has a hint of it. Um, you know, uh, Old Weller has a hint of it, um, has that little bit of that cherry note, but it's a little drier. It's not as soaked. It's not as uh, boozy. It's uh, just on the nose. It's, it's just a drier, uh, drier note, and I think, you know, if you look at the profiles and differences between them, that that to me is the big difference. Is that that cherry, uh, boozy cherry note that I pick up that's like soaked and new and freshly made in the uh, old red, 
um, just just right there. And this this one is a little drier, and that's not a bad thing. It's just it's just a little drier, and it's a little different, and it's not as prominent on the nose. Yeah, I mean, like you said, there's there's quite the price discrepancy between the two, and it's pretty much the same juice. It it is the same juice inside. So there's got to be something that makes them different. And from what I've heard and read, it's mainly the casks that are used. Um, the the pappy uh, section gets the first choice of casks, and then Weller, I guess, gets the next choice, or however that works. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, I, I've been to I've been to Buffalo Trace, and I've um, I've had uh, Drew Mayville, that's the master blender at Buffalo Trace. I've had him on the podcast a couple of times, um, and uh, it's interesting hearing his perspective on it. And uh, he always says like it's not necessarily better or worse, but it's intended to fit a certain profile. So um, it's the exact same recipe, like you said. Buffalo Trace doesn't release their recipes, but we kind of know it's seventy percent corn and. 16% wheat and 14% malted barley. That's kind of, the internet assumes that's the, the ratio. I have no way to confirm that. Um, so the, the ratio is the same, but I mean, a lot of things are the same, right? Buffalo Trace, Bourbon, and Eagle Rare have the same ratio, have the same uh, recipe as well, and they're different products. Um, so it's really, you know, this is one of the things I really love about whiskey. One of the things that really gets me about whiskey, I really love about whiskey is, um, it's not unlike wine where, you know, certain wines where the grapes grow at a certain part of the vineyard off the hill where it's get this beautiful seawater or, or most of the rain or the lack of rain. I don't know much about wine, but the idea being is like, hey, there's not a lot of rain. This is the dry soil. So these grapes really kind of really work through the sugars and, and the grapes get better and better. Um, and that's seen as the premium spot for that vineyard. And then they release kind of their general blends of like a um, a Bordeaux and then they have their Bordeaux, you know, and they name it after like a lot or a hill or something. And that's their special. That's where kind of the good stuff really gets grows. And uh, it's a little bit that same way with bourbon. Each barrel is different. And, you know, the location of where that barrel is in the warehouse makes a difference in what it tastes like. Um, and in the case of Buffalo Trace, they've got a lot of big distill, like a lot of big warehouses. And so they know, they generally know where the Pappy barrels are. They generally know where the Weller Beller barrels are, uh, but that's not always, you know, they still taste everything and make sure it all fits uh, a profile that they're looking for. Yeah, it's, and it's actually, uh, I think you're right on point there because um, it's crazy how some of, like, for example, um, Italian Primitivo, we're talking wine again here, but uh, Primitivo is basically Zinfandel. There are Zinfandel grapes. It's the exact same type of grape. It's the same species of grape, I guess you could say. But um, they they are drastically different in taste when you talk about a California Zinfandel and a Italian Primitivo. It's the same grape, but just different regions of the world and completely different tastes. So that's that's cool that you mentioned that. Where the barrel, depending on the positioning of the barrels in the warehouse, it can be very very different. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. And, and it all varies from distillery to distillery. Buffalo Trace uh, that makes Pappy Van Winkle and, and uh, Old Weller, they do, that's their specialty. Their specialty is having barrels all over the place in these large warehouses that, you know, some of them are, you know, over 100 years old. Uh, some of them are newer and, and they have this, you know, they have a system there. Um, other distilleries do things differently. Uh, you know, Maker's Mark and Four Roses are great examples. Uh, Maker's Mark uh, is still, probably, still the only distillery now, the only distillery that moves barrels around from top to bottom because if they're higher, they're going to age differently than when they're lower. So they keep the middle barrels the same, but then they shift all the barrels from the bottom to the top and they age from between five to seven years because that's going to influence the flavor of the whiskey. And their goal is to have everything be exactly the same. Uh, Four Roses uh, has different mash bills, has the two different mash bills and has different yeast strains but their maturation warehouses are very shallow. So they're, they're one floor only, uh, you know, Buffalo Trace will have 15 floors of barrels, uh, whereas Four Roses has a single floor uh, of stacked barrels. And that's all because they want that consistency. So they want that everything to taste the same um, because they vary things with mash bill and yeast. So they have a little bit of variation there, but the, the maturation process, they want the same. Um, so here is a great example of two different whiskeys that same formula, same recipe, uh, but there's a different aspect to them uh, because, A, H statement, this has been aged a little longer, 
uh, certainly that makes a difference, but also where those barrels are located. Um, and of course, you know, there's a lot less of this release than there is of this, uh, but both of these are small number releases. Uh, Weller, the reason why it's so expensive in the aftermarket is they don't have a lot of weeded bourbon in uh, Buffalo Trace that they make. They might make more now because now they know the demand, but you know, seven years ago when this was being, when this was being distilled, uh, they didn't know that there was going to be this much demand for Weller, so they don't have it right now. Yeah, yeah, true, very true. Um, I remember when I went to go pick, because the, the 107, the Pappy I'm talking about, the old um, Pappy Van Winkle, it's, it's more sought after from what my experience than the uh, Van Winkle 12. And the Van Winkle 12 has a, well, it has a higher retail price because it's an older whiskey, right? So, um, I, like, basically, it seems like all bourbon drinkers feel the same, whereas, like, when something's barreled at a higher proof, or sorry, bottled at a higher proof, uh, they're more interested in that whiskey. Like, how do the, how do the profiles vary between the 12 and the 10? Do you know anything about that? Or are, like, are they very different, the recipes? Or is it just the age and the fact that it's uh, the 10-year-old the is a little bit higher in proof? Great question. Uh, I, I think there's a couple of things that fall into place. And, and I agree with you. Um, I, you know, been saying, I, I think even in my book, I wrote, you know, like three years ago, I wrote this, that uh, between the 10 and the 12, uh, get the 10. Uh, the, the 10 is a better, uh, better bourbon, um, partially because of the proof level, but I, I think because of the higher proof and the younger, uh, the younger whiskey, it just has a lot more character. Um, the 12 is a bit of a go between the 10 and the 15. So as you would imagine, but the 15 is very smooth and, and sweet and it's got a lot of character and the cherries really come out, but it's, it's a very smooth whiskey. Like if somebody pays a lot of money for that and they drink really expensive scotch, that's like, you know, a 21 year old, uh, you know, Belvini or, or a 30 year old Belvini or something that's very much older, they will drink the 15 and the 20 and the 23 and they're going to get a lot of character there that they that they normally um, wouldn't expect in a bourbon. And it's a very kind of soft, smooth, uh, gentler whiskey that's got a lot of a lot of character, but it's a softer character. Uh, the 10 is a bomb of flavor. It's just a bomb of flavor. It's a higher proof. And um, oddly enough, the I, for me, the Weller 12, so the W Well, this this version, the W Weller has a 12 year old uh, whiskey. That's the same recipe, of course, as Old Rip, uh, Van Winkle 12. I love the Weller 12 better than even the Van Rick, Van Rick 12 because I find the Weller 12's got a little bit more character. A little, it's a little less refined. I guess it's a better way to look at it. Um, but it's funny you say that because I did a head-to-head -head, uh, blind with all like with four different bourbons and the Weller 12 and the Van Winkle 12 were involved in that in the blind tasting and the Weller 12 came above the Van Winkle 12 which I thought was pretty interesting in my like thinking in advance that the Weller the Van Winkle 12 was going to smoke everything and it actually came almost dead last yeah I, I totally agree with that I 100% agree with that the I've done I've done those blind I've reviewed them both. I've gotten uh, a lot of lot of uh, tastings, uh, gone through a lot of tastings with those. Um, I think the the twelve, the old, the Van Winkle twelve is a really good product. Uh, but I think you know, I think with Scotch, I look for a refined. I look for like a refined whiskey that's going to give me like subtle notes. Uh, I like to say like I like to drink Scotch in a quiet room where like there's not a lot of noise. Uh, and not a lot of not a lot of people necessarily around like uh, like quite a room. But with my bourbon, I want that bourbon to be loud enough that if I'm having a conversation, uh, if I'm in a louder room, that bourbon still takes my attention. So it has to be a little more obvious. And the less refined it is, um, the better it can do. And that's a great example of yeah, 100% agree. Waller 12 is a really terrific whiskey uh, and does very well, even though it's lower proof. It's not as high proof uh, as you know as the 107 here. Um, but it's still a really terrific whiskey and just has a lot of character and depth and a little bit of edge that I really enjoy about that uh, Weller 12 that I miss in the Van Winkle 12. Yeah. I really like that comparison, actually, what you just said about uh, drinking a scotch in a quiet room because you need to focus on the, the subtle differences or the subtle like nuances of the scotch, whereas bourbon kind of punches you in the face with flavor or, or you know aroma. So... You don't necessarily need that quiet setting to pick it up and appreciate it. Um, 
I think we should try this. What do you think? Yeah. Um, so I am. Uh, so I've been drinking as you've been talking a little bit. So uh, <laughs> go for it. Tell me what you think of yours because I've never, actually never actually had the official um, Van Winkle uh, Poor Man's Pappy, the the forty sixty mix. So you tell me what what that that tastes like. Yeah. So I, I've had it before. I I poured when uh, I had the bottles. My friend and I mixed a few of these, and I I took two hundred milliliter samples. This is a hundred milliliter sample. Um, I finished one because it was that good, and I'm going to give this one a sip and actually review it. So, the Weller 12 and the Van Winkle 12 are both at 45%. They are very nice whiskeys. Um, they have the sweet, they have, you know, um, what you would look for in a bourbon. But I find that you need that extra hit of heat or something to just fire everything up. And that definitely happens here. Um, I, I haven't really done the math on what the percentage of this would be. If the, if the 107 is, what, 53.5% and the, the Weller 12 is 45 and it's 60% 107. I'm not going to do the math, but it's higher than 45 for sure. <laughs> We're looking yeah, at it's, it's looking to be like a 48, 49, right? Give or take. Yeah. About 48, 49, I would say. Um, definitely, I, I would choose this over the Weller 12. And that's just because of the extra punch that it gives, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I think that's... Uh, the higher the proof in bourbon, the better you're doing. Uh, and you can always water whiskey down, but once the, once it's been watered down at the distillery, there's not much else you can do. Uh, I love that mix. I wish I was there with you trying to taste that uh, that mix because I think it's uh, it's interesting, and the comparison to the twelve is interesting as well. I love that. Yeah, yeah, I know it's um, it's definitely pretty good. Maybe if I can salvage the rest of this, I'll send it your way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been tasting uh, these two side by side, and. You know they are they they continue to be very similar. I think the uh, Weller and the Old Rip Van Winkle are. Um, I always have to be very careful with the naming because uh, Julian Van Winkle gets very upset. These this isn't the Pappy. A Pappy's got to be fifteen years or older. Uh, it is an Old Rip Van Winkle. Uh, there's always it's always important to name things correctly, right? <laughs> um, but this one is. Um, I do get kind of it's a little livelier with the cherry notes, a little sweeter. It does get dry, and I think the. Nice thing, what I like about these is uh, a weeded bourbon is, is an exception. Most, most bourbons have rye instead of wheat in the recipe. So um, that this has wheat instead of rye um, really means that the oak starts coming through really well as, as the whiskey gets older. So like I would say an, a young weeded bourbon maybe doesn't give you that same, like a four-year-old weeded bourbon doesn't give you that same flavor. But once you get in that seven plus range, uh, you're really tasting more that that wheat makes room for the oak spice. And so uh, normally the rye kind of hits everything and takes over the, the profile uh, later on in the eight statements and, you know, until like maybe 12 or, or older years. Um, but wheat le leaves a little bit of a gap, and but it gives volume. And I think that volume with that gap lets you taste something a little different, a little different on the palate that I, that I quite enjoy. Uh, you know, um, and these aren't the only ones. I mean, Maker's Mark, Maker's Mark and Maker's Mark 46 both do that same thing. Both are weeded bourbons. Uh, uh, Heaven Hills makes uh, Legacy. That's also a weeded bourbon. That's a cheap one. That's you can buy for 20 bucks in the U.S. Uh, so there are a lot of there. There are weeded bourbons out there that are cheaper and easier to find. I would say uh, Wellers and the Pappies uh, and Maker's Mark and Maker's Mark 46 especially are, are the better ones out there for sure. Yeah, I was, um, while we were talking, I was nosing this and I was actually pretty shocked at how oaky it is on the nose, considering it's a mix of 12 year old and younger with, um, you don't tend to get that kind of oakiness in a scotch until you hit about the 18 to 20 year range. So that's, I find that's pretty cool. Yeah, they're, they're, those distilleries, they, uh, it is a science and an art, and one of the things that they will do, for example, is, you know, when they barrel a whiskey, so they're they're using the weeded bourbon uh, recipe, and they're barreling, putting the whiskey, you know, white dog into the barrel. Um, they control the proof level that goes in based on how long it, they think that whiskey is going to age for. So, 
uh, what I'm what I have here, th this would never be as good as a 12 year old whiskey because they proofed it to the level where ideal oak, oak extraction would happen at seven or so years. Uh, same with this. This has been so. I mean, it's only you know two or three percent difference between maybe this and a, and a Pappy Van Winkle 15 or 20 or 23. It's a very minor minor uh, shift, but that little bit um, gives room for the oak to really take over the flavor. So if you make it too high proof, there's not enough oak activation. Takes a little longer. So you know, whiskeys like this are rare partially because of the science that goes into making them and how they, they control their proof levels. Even going in, they know how long that whiskey is going to be in the barrel. Now, sometimes they're wrong, and sometimes there's a barrel that's either exceptionally really good or exceptionally really bad, and then, you know, they might blend it into something else because it's either good or bad, or they might release it on its own. Um, but they know so that they can't plan for these things too far in advance. Uh, they, they can't, you know, they're probably making a lot of Pappy 23 right now, but it's still going to be, you know, they're 15 years before that comes out. Um, and, and that's what's really, what's been interesting, uh, going to the distilleries and talking to them. Um, and I, and I, you know, like people are say, ask me always, do you believe that? Like, could it just be a story? But I, I, I do believe it because, um, you go there and you see the signs and you see them, you know, changing proof levels as they're pouring, uh, whiskey into barrel. And, and you can't, you can't, you know, you, they're, they're doing the science to, to behind it to, to make it a better whiskey. For sure. Yeah. And it would kind of be foolish to put out a whiskey that's younger, that tastes better than older, supposedly uh, premium whiskeys. Like that would, that's never the intention for sure. I would assume. Right. Um, it, I mean, at the end of the day, you would hope that there's some um, room for that possibility to actually happen just because I think that, like there's not everybody can afford a 23 year old Pappy. Right. So you, I, I personally don't always like the oldest whiskey and that's something that people probably know if they follow my channel pretty closely that anything 20 years plus tends to be a little too astringent mm -hmm. a little too um sherried if it's a if it's a sherried scotch or too oaky if it's a bourbon if it's 20 years plus um i haven't tried pappy 23 and i'm probably never going to get a chance to try that because unless uh, i'm one of the LCBO corporates. I don't think they would let me win a bottle in the lottery. So, um, you know, it's four hundred dollars if you win it in the lottery. But you could probably buy a Macallan twenty-five year old for the price that the second-hand market goes for the Happy Twenty-Three. Not more. It's probably more expensive, actually. So, yeah, I there there is that there is that kind of psychological math that you do. I I agree with you as well. I. You know, for me, scotches generally kind of do really well around 15 years. I, and this is a blanket statement, so that's not always true. But I, I like, you know, like uh, there's a lot of scotches that I prefer, like uh, Glengoyne is a great example. Um, I love the 12. I like the 18. The 25, I'm like, it's, it's special. Like it is special tasting a whiskey that's been around for 25 years, aged in barrels. I mean, there, there's a special, there's an emotional component there. There's a kind of like, this is a special drink, but do I think it's better than the 18? I, I don't think it is. I agree, um, especially because you use that example. Um, I've had a chance to try the 25, which is right here. I love the 18. I adore the 12. I'm almost like, I, I want to try the 12 next to the 18, 25, because the 12 is so good. Um, it is. And it's funny that you use that example, because they're one of my favorite distilleries, and it's it's... That happens too often in Scotch, where the 25-year-old is not as good as the 18-year-old or or the younger. And I think you're bang on when you say around 15 is is the ideal. And obviously, it's not it doesn't go for every single Scotch, but for most, I've I've found that that's exactly the case. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I, and I think Glengoyne 12 is a great example. It's a you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of entry level 12-year-old Scotches in the market that are intended to be entry level. They're intended to be you know, nice and, and, and just very approachable. But then there's like really good 12 year old scotch and Glengoyne 12 is a great example of that. Um, and it's really hard to get better than the 12 in that Glengoyne line. I mean, 18 is a wonderful whiskey. Uh, but yeah, how much, uh, how much more are you going to get with 25? Or are you now fighting a whiskey that's just been aged for too long? Uh, and that, you know, what happens in the barrel is that the oxidation really, you know, is so prominent there that it, the whole idea is it takes very complex molecules and breaks them down. And this takes a very long time. 
Um, but I, you know, when it's too young, we don't like the complexity because it tastes too too strong or too, it's too too harsh on our palate. But after 25 years, well, we've got a lot of simple molecules there, um, and how much more flavor can that oak add? So it's uh, it's a very interesting uh, it's very very interesting that uh, that you know we come to the same conclusions. I that's great. I I think that's very much uh, true. There are of course always exceptions, right? There's always like that one really old whiskey like that is amazing, or that you know you know there's always that. But I think uh, I think the distilleries do know that when they're selling a 25, they're selling it for partially for that. Wow, it's just a 25 year old Scotch. That's pretty amazing. Um, and also, there, I should also add, and the other thing I'll say uh, about that is uh, a barrel doesn't just last 25 years. It has to be an exceptional barrel. Barrels leak. They, the evaporation rate can be higher on some than others. So for a barrel to last 25 years, that's pretty incredible. That's a rare thing. The only other counterpoint I'll make to this is scotch. in scotch, they can take a whiskey from one barrel and pour it into another barrel. And, and make it age of 25 years as long as, you know, they can, they can report as many times as they want. And that's that respect. So, you know, that's not always the case where you're getting that rare barrel of whiskey, but a lot of times you are getting that rare scotch that the barrels are able to last that long. And that's not, you know, hundred percent of the barrels wouldn't be able to last that long. There's a much smaller percentage there. So it is rare, uh, but yeah, give me the 15 uh, or, you know, yeah, that, that'd be fine. I agree. And, and, you know what? I think what's going to start to happen um, is distillers are going to start to realize that this is happening probably too often. And I think most of the big ones have already caught on. And there's going to be a lot more barrel play. So, um, you know, you have barrels that have been third fill. Uh, I, I think Balvenie does this with the 30-year-old. They use second or third fill for the 30-year-old. And then... You know, I'm not saying that they're going to transfer. I, I think a lot of these companies will say, let's transfer it over to a first fill for the last year or two years to give it that fresh sherry flavor and less of that oaky flavor throughout the age, but at the same time, get all that, you know, smoothing out the whiskey over all those years. So you're able to get the sweetness and you're able to get that smooth, uh, you know, whiskey that you're looking for and with that barrel play you i think a prime example of what i'm talking about is what you see with the brook laddie black art 4.1 i haven't had the 5.1 but um he hasn't revealed what's what's used in the in the 4.1 and i think there's a ton of barrel play going on there because it's so fresh and so sweet and so like uh totally not what you would expect for a 23 year old whiskey that uh, I think for sure um, you're getting some serious barrel play and science behind how to use barrels in the right way. Um, I'm just going to go through some of the comments here because I see, uh, I, I believe it's Scott from the Scotch Test Dummies uh, talking about Springbank 10 uh, and I think the 12 cast strength. Have you had an opportunity to taste either of those? Uh, I have, but very briefly, uh, very, very briefly. So I don't have a, I don't have a strong opinion on either of those. I, I probably like the 12 cast strength better. I'd have to check my notes, but that's going to be my guess. Uh, but Springbank's a great distillery. I, I do enjoy their products a lot. Yeah, I'm glad that the that the LCBO is starting to pull in some of their product. But for the longest time, we were uh, neglected uh, by Springbank. Maybe it's just because LCBO prices are astronomical and they don't feel comfortable selling their product here, but. Um, yeah, I, I've, I haven't had a chance to try the 12 cast strength, but everybody that I've talked to raves about it. So I, that's one of the younger, uh, scotches that I really need to try. Uh, Peter White is saying, uh, I have your black art five sample ready to go. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> <Buddy. laughs> um, that, I, we, uh, we talk about it on my channel all the time. We talk about uh, the Scotch Test Dummies talk about it all the time. Um, all the whiskey reviewers basically talk about the whiskey fabric and how we all kind of try to share. And once you're in this community, you, you find subscribers or, you know, you become friends with your subscribers because we're all looking for the same thing. We're all looking for good tasting whiskey. We all, we all want to share the experience and, Sometimes our closest friends are not very interested in whiskey, so we can't really share it with them. And we're all looking for that companionship to share, like, wow, this is an awesome whiskey. So uh, Peter's one of those guys that I was able and lucky enough to find um, through this channel. And 
Yeah, that happens all the time. I'm sure you've experienced something very similar. Yeah, the the community around whiskey is amazing. I've got, uh, yeah, I guess you probably can't see them. I've got a bunch of little bottle samples in the corner there that I just, uh, I'm waiting to drink. And, uh, you know, and sometimes people give me a bottle with a little question mark and they're like, here, you guess what this is, which I love. I mean, that's, that is, that is wonderful. Um, my friends all the time try to like try to really get me. They send me down to blind tastings and they pour out a bunch of stuff. And sometimes they like come back from trips to from like Taiwan or Japan and they're like, "Here, what do you think this is?" I'm like, "I I, I don't know. I have no idea." Um, but other times, you know, it, it, I, I enjoy kind of guessing what it could be. Uh, it is a wonderful community, and thank God because this is a very expensive habit to have. It is so much money uh, to get like little samples of something uh, and be able to taste it or review it or talk about it. Uh, it's a wonderful gift and it's a wonderful community that lets us have, lets us, you know, do this. Um, uh, so I love sharing my whiskey. I do so freely and I love having people come up to me and, and hand me their samples as well. So tell us about uh, which one do you prefer out of the uh, two that you have there, the poor man's pappy or the actual pappy? All right. I will tell you as I um, do some final sips, but I think I, uh, All right, so I'm. Uh, I definitely like this um, this more, uh, and I'll tell you why. I I go back to the cherry. I go back to the, that those silk cherry flavors. This starts off. Uh, so the I'll uh, raise the bottle. So this those cherry notes kind of hit a little on the front, and then it kind of gets really dry. And it's a wonderful dry feeling that the spicy oak really takes over. And so that I enjoy. Um, but it is a younger whiskey, and you can you can tell it's got a lot of bite to it. Um, where, whereas this, uh, that cherry flavor lasts longer, kind of quiets down. I always like talking like front, middle and back kind of, you know, over time, how long that, how that flavor develops uh, on the palate. And so for me, this develops with, with stronger cherries, sweetness through the middle and look, the fattiness brings more of that cherry kind of sweeter notes in, uh, combined with the, the spice, the, the this kind of more kind of cinnamon side, um, uh, so just just lovely, but I love them both. I you know like I mean I, I happily drink either one of these. Uh, if I was to choose which one's my favorite, I would definitely uh, pick this one. Uh, and again, I like this one more than the twelve, and I probably than the Pappy twelve, and I probably like this one more than the Pappy twelve as well. So kind of gives you an idea of where the scale is. Yeah, for sure. That's that's cool that you say that you like the Old Weller more than the Pappy twelve because a lot of people are paying astronomical prices for the Pappy twelve and. And it's it's definitely not necessary when you can get great whiskey for a lot cheaper. I uh, just want to give a quick shout out to uh, Basement Drummer Mel. He just started his own YouTube channel. Uh, if you guys are watching now, please go subscribe to his channel. He's an awesome dude. He supports all the whiskey reviewers. He's starting his own. He's doing it differently because he's trying to stick to uh, what he believes is the everyman's type whiskey. And he's doing a great job doing it. So... Check out Basement Drummer if you guys haven't already. Nice, um, love it. Yeah. Uh, Mark, I wanted to get into some other stuff with you because we were talking, I know we're around the 50-minute mark, roughly. Um, I wanted to talk about some, because we had had this conversation a little bit about how whiskey changes in the bottle. And there's a few examples I have here of how it can change either for the best or for the worst. And I think you have a couple of examples as well. Did you want to talk about that a little bit or what, how do you feel about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I am um, when I, I've been, I've been like reviewing whiskey in my mind for very long. Like I've been buying scotch, especially since I was, uh, you know, in my early twenties and I'd always buy a bottle and I would drink it down. So I'd buy a bottle at the LCBO, you know, and, I would take, you know, take, it would take me like three months or whatever, and I just have a little bit at a time. Um, and uh, I found that I never really liked the first pour of anything I purchased, and it was kind of weird. I was just very consistent. I was like, the first time I open it, I'm like, I just, I just don't quite like it. Um, and I gotta tell you, I've, I've gone to distilleries and I've talked to master blenders, and I, you know, some of them think I'm crazy, and some of them agree with me. So the idea being is that does whiskey change? in the bottle and of course the industry standard is no it doesn't um they you know that there's tons of distilleries that will tell you they'll take a spectrometer on this bottle and they'll it's exact exactly the same here as it is here if it was left out for two years so long as it's not in sunlight direct sunlight and kind of stored at room temperature or whatever 
the chemical chemical composition is exactly the same. Um, but there's the other part of it is other other master blenders tell me, well, that's kind of true, uh, but they have a feeling like there's something called bottle shock. So when they first pour the bottle, it doesn't quite taste the way they expect it to. Once it reaches the shelves, it's it's what they expect it to. But there's like a couple of weeks that the bottle that the whiskey is in there. So I, I think it depends on what's in the whiskey. So my, my best example of this, I'm going to pick on Canada a little bit. I, I love Canadian whiskey, but I'm going to pick yeah. on Canadian whiskey specifically because I think there's some Canadian whiskey that has, uh, you know, higher caramel content. And I can tell you, I know everybody's going to say, well, whiskey doesn't really oxidize in the bottle. And that's true. Oxidation is a very slow process. This is why it takes 25 years to age a 25-year-old whiskey. Oxidation is uh, very, very slow uh, in the case of whiskey because of uh, all the alcohol. However, um, Caramel is a, is, a, is a food additive, it's a sugar. Sugar breaks down in oxygen. Um, I, I understand that it's largely stopped within a bottle, there's too much alcohol in here. But the, when you get, I'll show you a bottle like this. Uh, this has a lot more uh, surface tension here, right? There's a lot more surface area than there is here. And so if you have a lot of sugars in here, a lot of the sugars, I believe, again, some, some master distillers will wink at me and say, you know, you're right. Others will tell me I'm crazy. Uh, but I do think they break down a little bit. So for me, I, uh, I find the first pour of a lot of whiskeys a little tight. Um, a little tight, maybe a little too hard hitting on one, one note flavors. But then I find that they get better and better. Uh, my rule, though, is once I get to like, once I get to this level. So I'm, I'm really good with the whiskey from here to here. I'm drinking this whiskey. To me, it tastes the same. Like there's no difference. Uh, but once I get down to here, I, that bottle is going to be gone in a month because I, I do feel that last little bit. Don't, don't, I, I've done this with so many but whiskey bottles. I know a lot of us do. We, we're like, this is my favorite. It's, it's a 21-year-old that I love. I'm just going to leave that last sip for a special moment. Don't do it. It won't, it won't <laughs> taste as good. I, 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 I swear to you, it will not taste as good uh, as, it, as that, that middle <laughs> meaty part did. Yeah. And you know what's funny is, um, you mentioned Canadian whiskey. I do find that there's a difference between the way a bottle will change if it's a Canadian whiskey, if it's a bourbon, if it's a scotch. I find scotch tends to get better as you progress. And maybe you're right about the last little bit. I probably, uh, once I get to the ideal point, I probably have a little too much of it and then it's, it's done. So I don't really experience that. Also so great way to do it. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> but I do find that uh, with Canadian whiskey, the best pour is the first pour. Uh, for most of them, not all of them. Um, I could be wrong. That's just my experience. I used to drink a lot of Forty Creek before I started this channel. Uh, I, I used to drink a lot of Crown and a lot of the things that are heavily caramelled, unfortunately. Um, so those ones in particular, I find drastically get worse as the bottle progresses. Whereas for example, the one that I'm going to use tonight, and I will be reviewing this shortly, is the uh, Macallan 17. All right, so that's what it looks like. Um, nice. It's. I started this bottle off, and I was immediately disappointed because I had I purchased these in Arizona. They're actually bottled in 2009. I I. I picked them up this summer. So if you're in Arizona, guys, go pick up some Macallan 17 year old because. It's probably the best price you're going to find anywhere. It's 170 American. Um, and they're bottled in 2009. So if you're into the secondary market, these actually should be a lot more expensive than the 2017 ex uh, expression. Um, anyway, the beginning of this bottle was very disappointing. It, it was almost like too thin. Uh, borderline watery and didn't really have much character as it sat in the bottle. I kind of left it for a month and a half, um, open, not open, not, not with the cap off, but what I mean is after I had my first jam and it's subtly changed to a much better, not, I wouldn't even, actually not even subtly changed to a, um, much better dram because it's more thick. You actually, it's the one Macallan, and I checked with Nicholas um, Bilalon from, who's the ambassador of Macallan, and it's lightly peated. It actually has about two or three uh, ppm, but you 
you would think that you can actually pick that up. Two or three ppm is very low for uh, uh, for any type of scotch, but uh, you actually do pick it up on this whiskey, which is kind of strange, especially on the nose. Not as much on the palate, but it's much better. So um, I would say my opinion, cast strength definitely plays a, a, a factor. If it's a cast strength whiskey, it will get better as the bottle goes down levels, in my opinion. Um, Canadian whiskey tends, especially if it's uh, chill filtered with added color, tends to be as good as it's possibly going to get with your first pour, and then it gets worse as it progresses. Uh, and I'm not, I'm still on the fence with bourbon because I've had some that are really good in the beginning and then not so good at the end and then vice versa. So um, I don't know. I, and I mentioned this to Jamie actually when I did the interview with Jamie and she told me to bring this up with you because I, <laughs> she was curious what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, I, I you know what, I, we're on the same page. It's funny because you and I have not talked about whiskey before. Uh, and like it's funny how we're on the same page. I agree with you. I, I as you were talking, I brought a bottle of Crown Royal. Um, I agree with you. Canadian whiskey, especially like kind of in the Crown Royal area, is pure butterscotch sweetness, and it's got this beautiful layer of butterscotch. Um, that that butterscotch dissipates very quickly. And so, I mean, you know, you look how look how look how big this bottle is up here. This is this is not a good this is not a good bottle for storage. I, I should have drank this long ago. I just happened to pull this out of the back. Um, I will say though, uh, talking about whiskey that's done held up really, really well. Uh, Gunnheim, I'm not going to say that correctly. Gunnheim 18. Um, I just finished this uh, a couple of days ago, uh, and I did actually nurse this one. This bottle I nursed and nursed and nursed. I really, really love this whiskey. Um, and guess what? It's not chill filtered, no caramel added. Uh, yep. It's bottled at 56, 46.3% uh, alcohol. A very stable, like 45, 46%. It's a, likely to be a very stable percentage for uh for alcohol uh because i agree cast strength of course changes there's so much booze in there you open that bottle up all this alcohol just evaporates every time you open the bottle i mean it just happens because it's so it's so high uh this to me held up from first pour to last pour perfectly so maybe there's something to the filtration caramel and the proof level like somewhere in the middle yeah uh really quickly jeff take care buddy thanks for joining us tonight jeff is actually sending her he sent uh, a whiskey fabric. He had a whiskey fabric made. Sent it to me first, and I'm gonna be. Set, I sent it out to Bubba and the Beard. They're gonna sign it as well. Uh, all the whiskey reviewers are gonna sign it. So, um, thanks. Good night, Jeff. And uh, what's up? What's up to uh, Swami and Mark from Whiskey Whistle? What's up, guys? Um, but I have an 18. It's funny that you mentioned that because is yours the one that's blacked out? Do you have a blacked out? Um, no, mine isn't, but I'll tell you why that's there. Um, I, I asked that question. Do you know why it's there? Oh, like maybe, you know, I, I trying to remember. I, I reviewed it. And so basically, um, the LCBO tested it, and it, it came in at a lower ABV than what Bunnahabin thought it was. So they that's sent really, it. Yeah. What, what's yours at? 56, or sorry, 46.4 or something like that? 46.3%, yeah. Yeah. And this one is actually 45.7 or 0.8, something like that. Yeah, it's funny, right? Because that's kind of how it works. If you have a 0.3 on something, you're assuming a certain bit of accuracy on it. Yeah, I've seen that in a few bottles where they, they black it out, and it's typically when it says the proof level or if the proof level is not quite as accurate. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and that's the one thing I would like give props to the LCBO about because – most, and well, especially if it's privatized liquor companies, you have these small whiskey shops. They're definitely not testing their whiskey. They can't afford to open up a really expensive bottle, have it tested, and then, you know, sell their product. They're, they're bringing in based on what they feel is, you know, the word of this distillery. So the LCBO takes it like a case at a time sometimes and tests all the bottles in that case. And then we'll... They, the process is forever because uh, I, I'm sure you've heard it from Jamie a few times where um, the LCBO will take a product that you're hoping to get up on the shelves a lot sooner than you think it's going to get out. And it doesn't happen because they're making sure that everything is okay with that whiskey. Um, I know that's happened with McAllen. I know that's happened with um, Glenfiddich 
with the actually most recently with the IPA and the the uh, project XX uh, that took a lot longer than what than what was anticipated I think so yeah yeah that's that's uh it is interesting the way the LCBO controls the flow. In some cases, it's because of testing. In some cases, because they haven't gone to it. In some cases, they just don't want to release it. Um, the I, I was uh, when Highland Park Thor came out. I went to this beautiful, beautiful dinner. It was like the launch party of Highland Park Thor, and it happened in February of that year. And the whiskey didn't. And you know, it's a, it was a bunch of media people who were all there, to ready to write about Highland Park Thor, and the product didn't come out till some like December. Um, <laughs> so it's one of those like clearly, you know. The whole deal was no rush. Meanwhile, the people behind Highland Park and the PR company's like, "Come on, like we we got the press and just release the product, please." Exactly. Um, but LCBO is one of the best labs in the world, and they do a lot of really uh, great things. Uh, but I think, like you said, there's a good and a bad that comes with the LCBO, so we, we need to take it for both the good and the bad. Yeah. I, I one day I feel like they're gonna come and shut down my channel because all I do is bash the LCBO. <laughs> <laughs> you saw, I think criticisms are fair, right? I mean, you can't, you know, we, you know, we can get our weather twelve, we can get our weather for thirty-five bucks, which is rare in the U.S., but we, we have to do a lottery for it half the time. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then, like even, I'm sure um, some some people from Belvini are not happy with the prices that the LCBO charges for Belvini product when you can get it for less than half in the United States. It's, it's kind of scary. Yeah, it's a good point. There, there, there are products that are priced well. Uh, I think Ardbeg 10 is a great example. Uh, it's a hundred dollar whiskey here. You go to the U S you can get it for 50 bucks. Um, yeah. before crazy. when the exchange rate was at par, it was a $50 whiskey in the U S it was a hundred dollar whiskey here. Um, so it's, uh, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not perfect. <laughs> no, exactly. And, and you know what? There, like you said, there's a lot of good things. Like they're 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 the second largest buyer in the world for for alcohol. So I mean, um, we have a lot of product that that's at our beck and call, but you know we got to pay for it. The the monkey that lives at warehouse spins the wheel. Everybody stands around waiting for the wheel to stop, and whatever it lands on, that's the price that they put uh, on the price tag. Yeah, that's right. The price is, you're right, that's the biggest drawback is there's no competitive market. Um, and and um, that, you know, you look at people, I mean, uh, there's a lot of people that just buy from Alberta. It's quote unquote not legal, but they they do purchase in Alberta and have the whiskey shipped here. Uh, because, and, you know, but that's also a good example because Alberta bourbons are expensive. Uh, there's, you know, companies like Jim Beam and Four Roses and Buffalo Trace you know, you don't get Weller 107 unless you sell a lot of Buffalo Trace product, a lot of Sazerac product. So we have pretty good prices on bourbon here. We actually have, you know, you go to a place like Four Roses Single Barrel. It's 40 bucks here. It's about 40 bucks in the U.S. It's practically at par. Uh, Maker's Mark. There's all these examples of how our bourbons are really cheap at the LCBO. Um, and in, in Alberta, they're not. But you look at Scotch, whole other story. Uh, scotch is so much cheaper in Alberta. Uh, there's different places that sell different bottlings, different ages, and they compete on price and you get really, really cheap products. So it really, it depends where you are in the marketplace. And that's, that's a lot of the reasons why I started drinking more bourbon, you know, five, eight years ago, because it was, you know, scotch prices were going through the roof and bourbon was still cheap. It's not as cheap anymore though. It's, uh, it's gone up in price, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's still better. It's still Ontario is a really good bourbon market for popular brands that, and, and some rare brands. And, uh, and it's not a good market for single malt scotch. I think that's, uh, there, there's places where we got charged more for sure. For sure. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's crazy because like you said, the, you'll go to the States and have to pay at par, if not sometimes more for a bottle of bourbon that we could get. Uh, but you know, I, and I think the, the Weller and the, the Van Winkle is a prime example of that. I, the lowest price I've ever heard for a Van Winkle 12, and that's retail after winning a lottery, is about 90 bucks in the US. We're getting it for about 120, so after the exchange, it's pretty much the exact same cost. Um, you know, but what's crazy is the secondary market in the States for certain bourbons. Like, a Van Winkle 12, people are willing to pay 400 to 500 bucks for. Yeah, right. I, uh, on the on the podcast, I had uh, uh, a guy out of New York. Yeah, he's 
he doesn't go by his real name uh, because he trades a lot in the secondary market. And um, he generally does, uh, he buys to, he'll buy if he sees something like a Pappy 20 is a good example. He's not a big fan of Pappy 20. But if he sees a bottle or two, he will buy whatever he can, and he'll pay a thousand dollars for it because he knows for that Pappy Twenty, he'll be able to trade, you know, two B tax or three B tax or something. He knows in that aftermarket trade, he'll be able to. It's it's almost like sports. I mean, you you want the star player. You're like this star player is too old. He's no good. But I know if a team's going for the you know for for the World Series, they're they're going to want that player. Not going to get three younger guys that aren't as appreciated for that team. And that's kind of how it works in the U.S. Uh, it just it is all illegal, though. Like, I mean, I mean, we talk about this, but it's technically not legal to do that. And places like Kentucky, what they've done is they've allowed uh, past laws where you can now sell your whiskey through a store. So if you have a bottle of Pappy 20, you go to the store, somebody buys it from you, that exchange happens. Uh, the store collects a little bit of money. The state collects a little bit of money. But on the other hand, at least the store validates that it's actually Pappy 20 and not, not you know, not right. fake. Um, no. And so there's a little bit of validation. There's a little bit of service there that comes with it, and, and you're able to do it safely. Um, so that's interesting, right? Like it's a whole world. But the community in the U.S., you know, they they trade and they know each other and they do very well at trading and uh, and and they do bottles. We we here do little samples to kind of give each other's little taste. Like here's you know Brickwadi Black uh, Black Arts 5.1. Have a taste of it, you know, at your own pace. Uh, but there, that's it's bottles. They trade bottles and they do it for money. Yeah, it's a different story. Yeah, I had someone that wanted to trade um, an Elijah Craig 18 for a Van Winkle 12. Um, the trade didn't end up working out. I ended up trading the Van Winkle 12 for this bottle of uh, Cavallano Montalato Solist. Oh, nice. That's a good yeah, trade. I got, I got pretty lucky, yeah. <laughs> I got pretty lucky. I but uh, this guy's from Taiwan, and he... Uh, Larry from Cavafan, if anybody's interested, go check him out. He's a super cool guy. Um, he gets these bottles at what we would think are like, you know, great prices. So he's able to make a, a, a move like that. And if really, if you wanted to turn around and sell the Van Winkle 12 in Taiwan, it would probably collect a ransom of like crazy money because it's not available up there. You know what I mean? So um, for for most of us we look at that trade and like wow what like what a great trade for rob but he actually probably benefits from this trade quite a bit too yeah i mean to be fair cavalan is more available in the us i've seen it around whereas elijah craig is, is rare it, it's definitely on the rare side so i i love that cavalan that's a great for um that's a great trade from that point of view but uh but yeah i know price wise you can't it's it's a different story yeah interesting yeah so um, we're rounding up at around an hour. I think we have we started a little late today. We started around, what, 9.10, I think, 9.15, something around there. Um, so what I was thinking is maybe you got, you can uh, talk, tell everybody where they can find your book, where they can find your podcast, anything else you have going on that you'd like to share. And, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sounds good. No, I appreciate that. Uh, so uh, my book is The Whiskey Cabinet. Uh, it's, uh, like I said, it's about 50,000 words. It goes through, the way I wrote this book is uh, as an introduction, but um, I knew, you know, a lot of people know a lot about the single malt scotch or bourbon or Japanese whiskey, but not necessarily everything. So I talk about every country and what are the benefits of every, you know, every country and what are kind of things to watch out for. So, I mean, a great example is America where, um, you know, bourbon still is the most regulated whiskey in the world. There's nothing regulated as heavily as bourbon, not single malt scotch, not anything else. If it says bourbon or straight bourbon on it or straight rye, um, it is it is incredibly heavily regulated for consistency. And I talk about that. I'll talk about the Canadian industry and kind of the differences and where, where flavor comes from. And it's also, you know, it's a little bit of a journey too for myself and talk about my experiences in whiskey. Um, so this is available uh, in Indigo, but buy it online, amazon.com.ca. That's, it's all there. It's, uh, it's, I think it's like $18. It's always on sale. It's all books on Amazon are. So it's, uh, it's usually about $18, give or take. Um, and then uh, the podcast is called The Whiskey Topic, and that is available on iTunes and any other podcasting app. Episodes go about an hour. Uh, they're usually funny and 
you know, lighthearted with a little bit of uh, a lot of whiskey geek talk as well. So it's kind of a little bit of both worlds on there. Uh, whiskey topic is, um, like I said, so it's uh, probably now we're number two in the world for, for whiskey podcasts. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's got a wonderful, it's grown so well. Um, and then I also do private whiskey tasting. So if you work for a business, um, you know, I work for a lot of companies that are in the startup field or uh, finance, banks, you know, companies with like that, that have budgets for, for kind of big whiskey events. So, you know, instead of bringing a consumer in, uh, customers in and showing, selling, you know, really expensive old whiskeys and just pouring it for them, uh, have somebody like myself come in and talk about the whiskeys. Um, give you a bit of a history about them and everything else. That's uh, also something that I do as well. And that's kind of, you know, and then of course my website is, um, I'll give you the, the easier thing, whiskeybuzz.net. So whiskey with, the, with an ear, without any dot net. I'm not as active there, but I do a lot of whiskey reviews, uh, written whiskey reviews, and that's where the podcast is as well. Awesome. Honestly, Mark, this is awesome. Very informative. I know just reading the, the live chat as it was scrolling a lot of these guys were really impressed with uh, your knowledge and what you brought to the table tonight so thank you so much for joining us and um maybe we can do this again i would like to have you and jamie on the channel one day together that would be pretty cool i think so hopefully we can do this again and uh i had a blast so thank you very much yeah, no, thank you, Rob. I appreciate it as well. I, I love what you've been doing. I love how this website, how the the channel has grown amazingly since I first watched you, and I and I love watching the progression. So I really appreciate having you on, and I uh, hope to do this again. Absolutely. Cheers. Thanks, buddy. Okay, guys, that's it for now. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>